Welcome to worship this morning for the fourth Sunday of Easter. My deepest apologies and sympathies. You had me for two weeks in a row now. But it's so good to be back here again at St. John's. I hope you enjoy the worship service this morning. God bless each and every one of you as you continue to live out your Christian faith and life during this week. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to God, and to Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm this morning is taken from Psalm 23, the Shepherd's Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our New Testament reading is taken from the book of Acts chapter 2, beginning at the 42nd verse. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Our epistle reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning at the 19th verse. This is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who just, judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 10th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he was brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they will have life and have it abundantly. 
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning's text is taken from the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 42, which was just read a little while ago. There was a young boy and his father. The boy asked his father, he said, Dad, what's a religious traitor? His dad replied, it's a person who leaves our church and joins another one. The boy thought about that and then said, well, what is a person who leaves another church and joins ours? The father looked at him and smiled and said, that's a convert, my son, a convert. The question I have today is, what in the world was the early church like in the New Testament? After the resurrection, the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, what did the church look like? Acts chapter 2 tells us, first and foremost, it was a learning church. They continued to listen to the apostles as they taught. One of the great dangers of the church is to look backwards instead of forwards. And because of the riches in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ are never ending, we always need to be looking ahead and moving forward as well. It's a wasted day when we learn nothing new and we haven't penetrated more deeply into the wisdom and the grace of God himself. So continue to read, study, learn from Holy Scriptures, and spend time one-on-one -on -one with Jesus Christ and you will always continue to grow because your faith and mine never remains the same. Faith is either growing or it is dying, just as we are. Secondly, the church was also a church of fellowship. It had what someone once called the great quality of togetherness. The church is always a family of brothers and sisters in Christ, and families are always unique. Each one is different, and each one is also similar. So what do families do? Well, they argue, they fight, they laugh and they enjoy each other's company. Church is exactly the same way. No matter what the struggles and the joys are in life, everyone is affected and everyone keeps coming back. That's what families do and that's what families of faith do. So if you think churches today are struggling, always remember Jesus Church. When he started his church, the pastor himself, Jesus Christ, was executed. The chairman of the board, which was Peter, was cursing, swearing, and denying his position. The good old treasurer known as Judas committed suicide after embezzling funds. And all the other board members, or the other rest of the apostles, they all ran away. The only ones left were a few women from the ladies' age. The reality is that churches are never really that bad. The gospel of Jesus Christ continues to go, and families of faith continue to grow from one generation to the next. The other thing about the church is that it was also a praying church. These early Christians knew they cannot meet life with their own strength, and they didn't need to. They always went to God in Jesus' name before they went out into the world. They were able to meet again the daily problems of life because they met him first. It was also a very reverent church. The word fear in verse 43 has the idea of respect behind it. The Greeks believed that they lived and moved through this earthly world as if it was a temple. The Christian lives in reverence because we know that the whole earth is the temple of the living God. And it was the church itself where things happened. Signs, wonders were very evident. As we expect great things from God and attempt great things for God, things happen. And more things get accomplished as we believe that God and we, working again together, can make them happen. This is also why the church was a sharing church. These early Christians had an intense feeling of responsibility for each other. A Christian, again, cannot bear to have too much when others have too little. This is why we live simple lives so that other people can simply live. It was also a worshiping church. They never forgot to go to God's house and meet him face to face within his grace place. God knows absolutely nothing about private Christianity. 
because either the privacy will destroy the Christian faith or the Christian faith will destroy the privacy. Faith, yes, is incredibly, incredibly personal. Your faith is personal to you. My faith is personal to me. Yet at the same time, our faith is very public. It is never private. This is why things always happen when we come together. God's Spirit moves us, His worshiping people. Right now, it doesn't feel that way, especially seeing that we're worshiping together through the internet. But that too is going to come to an end soon, and we'll be back together again here in God's holy house. It was also a joyful church. Gladness was there. A gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms. The cross and the resurrection changes us from the inside out. This is why Jesus fills us with faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is always love. All of these things the world is missing because the world does not have them. The world is looking for them, but it cannot have them and does not have them apart from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When people begin to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and have Him in their lives personally, as the church does, now we have all the beauty of heaven and all the gifts of the Spirit that comes along with it. This is why a hurting and dying world around us is attracted to the church, and it's attracted to our living Lord. On a very quick side note, I've noticed lately, especially talking to other pastors and people inside of the church, that more people in the world now are asking questions. And they are asking questions about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Christian faith as they are attracted to the church and to Him through the internet, through congregations such as St. John. The Lord knew what he was doing, that something good would come out of this pandemic. Our Lord always has a way to take Good Friday and turn it into an Easter Sunday. That's why it was also a church that people liked. It had winsome attractiveness about it. Because real Christianity, that's always a lovely thing. There are many people who are good in this world, but their goodness has a streak of self-serving hardness to it. The early Christian New Testament church was very attractive compared to the harsh world that you and I live in. Nothing's changed. So the question is, how do we measure up today? How can we become more like the New Testament church at the time of the resurrection and ascension of our Lord? Note again verse 47 of our text. They were constantly witnessing and praising God. And the Lord added daily to his church. We're all representatives of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to someone else within our lives. Because people read you and they read me more than they ever read Holy Scriptures. So continue to witness and praise Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in your life. And yes, other people around you will notice. And remember that the church as a whole is a family of faith to reach the world that you and I are in. In your baptism grace, you already are, and you will and can remain a part of that family of faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.
O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we, your wandering sheep, gather within your courts today. Accept our praise for nourishing us within the green pastures of your holy word. For leading us beside the still waters of your forgiveness, we thank you. You have restored our souls by leading us in the paths of Christ's righteousness. For your goodness and mercy, which follows us all the days of our life, we thank you. And yet, O oh Lord, in spite of your goodness and mercy, we have often strayed from the paths of righteousness. We have failed to pass on that same goodness and mercy to others. We lack patience in bearing the sufferings we bring upon ourselves by our own errors and judgment. Not only have we been impatient with ourselves, but we have also been critical and impatient with other people. We have not learned to suffer patiently, especially when that suffering has come upon us unjustly. We often forget that Christ suffered unjustly for our sins. We have often struck back in word and deed against those who have mistreated us. For these and many other sins, too numerous to count, we ask your forgiveness. Send us your Holy Spirit, O Lord, to strengthen our faith. Let him help us recognize that Jesus Christ is the only door into your kingdom. Help us to believe that he is the only source of an abundant life, both here and hereafter. Help us to realize that the abundant life consists not only in things that we possess, but also in the treasures you have stored up for us in your heavenly kingdom. Bless our leaders and church and state and cause them to carry out your holy will. Grant our petitions in the name of him who is the entrance door to your divine majesty, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray together the prayer that Jesus Christ himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my prayer come to you. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you. For you answer me. Hide your face from my sins. And my all my Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a fresh spirit. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with the Holy Spirit. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my Lord is so crazy. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will seek your glory. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I will walk in your truth. You have not my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart. And I will glorify your name forever. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is your friend. Save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have awakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we will know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. 
through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you will keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my duties in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.